Good morning, and we are ready to start. Welcome back to the Zohar class. And today we're going to be learning the Torah portion of Beha Aloscha. It's uh, the Torah portion that has many interesting uh, lessons in it. And we're going to dive right in. And just to give you a brief introduction about today's lesson, the highlight of today's lesson is the fact that everything in the Torah is exact. There is nothing in the Torah that is just a matter of story. So that's the topic that we will be covering today. That every single word in the Torah has a reason for being there. And we are now, for those that joined us uh, late, I'm going to repost the document again. It is now on the chat section and you could download it. So we are ready to start. Rabbi Shimon Omar, this is from Zohar, volume three, page 152. And says, Omar, Rabbi Shimon Omar, Rabbi Shimon said, Vai lehahu barnosh de Omar. Oy vei, woe to a person that says that the Ha'oraisa also the Achazo Osi Purim Ba'alma, that the Torah has come to tell us just stories. In other words, a person may look at the Torah and view some of the things that have been written there as just, okay, it's a beautiful narrative and there is a story being told here in the Torah. So therefore, these have been said. And this is precisely what the Zohar is warning us, that that should not be the view of a person. This opening of what we just said by Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is actually coming on the heel of just a page earlier in the, uh, in the book of Zohar, where there's a discussion amongst Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and the students uh, about the commandment of Passover. And the question that comes up is where it indicates in the Torah that it was, behold, on the second year after the Jewish people had left Egypt, and God is giving them a commandment about Passover. So the question there becomes, why the repetition? God had already commanded the Jewish people about Passover the first year when they were leaving Egypt. So they were told about it. Why now on a second year, God has to tell them again? So the Zohar launches into a whole second level of explanation besides the first one that was explained earlier at a different location as to why this is repeated and it has specific reason, there is a need for it. It's not just that the Torah happened to repeat this commandment again. So it's on the heel of that discussion that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai opens up with this section that we are discussing. And, and he says that woe is to someone who thinks all of this is just a story. So in the text, he continues and he says, if, if for someone to think that's, that the Torah is just talking about stories and simple uh, words, the Ihachi, Rabbi Shimon says, because if so, if somebody thinks that this is just some narrative of the story, even in our time, referring to his own time, and on the we could also make a Torah. 
you know, us, us people, regular people could sit around and create something and call it a Torah, the meal in the with simple matters of, of, of the world. And you know what? We could do a great job. There's a lot of interesting stuff in the world that we could sit down and write about and, and voila, call it a Torah for everyone to, to study. And if, if it's all about just uh, worldly matters, there are even many um, dignitaries of the world in his time he's referring to, princes and dukes and kings and governors of, of that time. They have a lot of wise sayings, a lot of wise lessons that they, you know, that they put out or they wrote books or whatever it may be. You know, in these days, uh, perhaps the history of the of United States is not as rich as other parts of the world. But in other parts of the world, in particular, we're talking about the Middle East and Far East and so on and so forth. Okay, it's already for a couple of thousand uh, years, there has been civilization and there have been many philosophers and, and many people that were studious and learned and they have put out a lot of interesting sayings, okay, and it's interesting codes and so on and so forth. So Rabbi Shon Bar Yochai says, hey, you know, we, we could have just gather all these wise sayings and, and create a Torah, but of course, then that is not the point. That's not a godly Torah. We're talking about a godly Torah, so therefore, everything in it is exact. Elokol milin ihochi nezel abasaihu. If so, so there is a lot of wise people in our generation too. We could go after them. But now, but minayhu araisa, we could create from it a Torah. Kehay gavna. Elokol milin doraisa milin iloin inun. But rather, all the words of the Torah are are really uh, amazing, amazing, uh, lofty words. Verazin ilain. And there, are, there is deep secrets in them. The tochaze alma ilav ve alma tatoa. So now Rabbi Shun Bar Yochai continues and wants to explain what he just said a little bit better. So he says, "Tochazi, come and see, alma ilav ve alma tatoa bechad maskelo iskalu." Come and see that the upper worlds and the lower worlds were all created with the same equal weight. Meaning, whatever there is in the upper worlds, it also exists in the lower worlds in the physical world. Yisrael lesato maloche ilo eila That the Jewish people are down here in this world and they are corresponding to the angels that are in the upper world. Let's see what does it say, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says, about the angels that are in the heavens above. So it says uh, over there, that God has made the angels into spirits. In other words, in the book of Tehillim, in, in the book of Psalms, when King David is talking about the angels, says that God has made it into um, spirits. So, so they don't have a body. So therefore, when they come down to this world, so therefore they need to enclose themselves in the clothing, physical clothings of this world in order for them to be manifested. As a matter of fact, we learned in the Haftorah of this past Shabbat, you know, after we read the seven portions of the Torah itself, it's customary to learn to read in the, in the synagogue a portion of the book of the prophets that is similar in content to the Torah portion of the week. And this week's Torah portion, this past week's Torah portion, Nasu, the, the Aftora was all about Shimshon, Samson. And over there, it talks about the, the message that the mother uh, of Samson received. 
from an angel to give her the good news that she's going to have a baby after they couldn't have any children. And what would be and what should be her conduct as far as how to bring up this child. So over there it says that the angel came and appeared to the mother and she had no idea it was an angel. She just thought it's a, it's a holy person because this person came and was giving a blessing to her. And then went to the husband and they came back and again they had the same uh, a visit and they were talking and so on and so forth and all the way till the end when they offered an offering of thanks, a sacrifice to God for, for the blessing that they're receiving and saw the reaction of this who they thought was a person and suddenly this person disappeared. So that's when they realized, oops, that was an angel and we didn't realize. So the angel had appeared in a physical body. So, so the Zohar is saying that when an angel has to appear down here in this world, has to enclose itself in a physical clothing. And if the angels wouldn't be enclosing themselves, in some sort of a physical clothing, and that's allegorically speaking, clothing. We're talking about a physical body. So then the angels wouldn't be able to actually stay and exist and last in this physical world. And also the world wouldn't be able to tolerate the angel in its pure form. And if that's the case, when we're talking about angels, or I said the water the who bought a alma cool who the coin in beginner, so the Torah which has created the angels and created all the worlds and everything that exists in the world, and they all exist for the sake of the holiness of the Torah. Al Achas Kama Vikama Kavan the Nachas Lahai Alma. So how much more so what we're talking about. The, the Torah that came down to this physical world and was given to the Jewish people to, to be learned. He loved the Mislapsha behind in the bush in the high Alma. So how much more so if the Torah wasn't enclosing itself in physical clothing, meaning again, allegorically in physical matters of this world, lo yachil alma le misbal, so then the world wouldn't be able to tolerate the the extensive and deep holiness that lies within the Torah. So the Torah, even though it's the wisdom of God and is coming from the supernal wisdom, which is higher than the levels of the Sefirot of Atzilut, but when it comes down to this world, in order for this world to be able to, to tolerate that immense holiness in its raw format, Therefore, this wisdom of God had to enclose itself in physical matters, in physicality, things that we deal with every single day. And if not, then it would have been impossible for us to be able to relate to any subject matters in the Torah. Why? Because by virtue of how we are created, as long as we are, our soul is vested in a physical body, we would not be able to properly comprehend the supernal wisdom, the wisdom of God. So the only way for it is if there is the clothing, just like our eyes wouldn't be able to see the angel unless the angel has taken on the shape of a physical body. Otherwise, the angel would be too much for us to comprehend, to perceive, and to surely to feel. So too, even more so, is the Torah which its level of holiness is higher than the angels, higher than the world, because in fact, through the Torah uh, is, and the Torah is the blueprint of the creation of the world. So for us, which are now in the lowest world, in the world of Asiya, to be able to relate and comprehend Torah to any extent, it's only if the Torah has been drawn down also to physical matters which is the reason why the commandments that we have 
all have to do with day-to-day -day life or seasonal mitzvahs, but we talk about physical life. You know, you shake the lulav of an esrik, you put on tefillin, you keep Shabbat, you eat kosher. They all represent very deep and intricate details of holiness of how we're connected to God, and that's why we do it. But on the surface, it just seems like, oh, there's laws about how to eat. And, and therefore, this story, which is in the Torah, referring to any story in general, but of course here the subject matter is what, was, what is said in this week's Torah portion about the, the mitzvah of Passover. Remember with the fact that it was repeated. So, so Rabbi Shun Bar Yochai is saying, so therefore this story in the Torah, man de choshit de hahu lebusha ihu oraisa mamish velo milo achra, the person that would simply look at the story of the Torah and think that the storyline is the entirety of Torah and there's nothing beneath it. So such a person <laughs> this person is going to have his soul leave him and, and he's, going to, he's going to pass away. <laughs> and he will have no share in the world to come. Why? Because he, his eyes are closed. He doesn't understand what's going on here. doesn't understand the real, uh, the, the real message uh, in Torah itself. Begin Koch Omar David, and because of this, King David has said in the book of Psalms a, a very famous verse that says, Gal Einaiva Abito Niflo is Mitorosecha. That uh, King David says it in chapter 119, which is the longest chapter in the book of Psalms, and in verse number 18. So that will be easy for you to remember where King David says, Gal Enai, open up my eyes so that I could see your wonders from, uh, out of your laws, out of your Torah. So in other words, what King David is saying is that just reading the Torah simply is not the real message in there. The real message is when you look deeper. So that's why he was asking God, please open up my eyes. I am reading your Torah. I'm studying it, but I want to understand the real wisdom of God that is hidden in these words of Torah. He wanted to understand what is beneath the clothing of the Torah, so to say which is the, the secrets of the Torah in, in all the stories that are in there. And the Zohar continues and says, Tochoze, come and see. Another example of this would be from a different angle. Is levusha des chaze lekola. There is clothing that would be seen to everybody. And there are some foolish people that when they see that somebody is dressed with beautiful clothing, so which in their eyes it looks like, wow, this person is really dressed properly. So then they don't, they no longer look to see what's further in this person and what's behind it. But rather, they, they suddenly attach an importance to this person according to his clothing. Now, it may not be the clothing, it may be the car they're driving, it might be whatever. But people, what the Zohar is saying, a lot of people just superficially, they, they give a glance at a person and whatever they perceive uh, at that superficial look, they go, ah, okay, this person is a very important person. Aval Be'emes. However, truthfully, the importance of that uh, clothing is really the body. 
and the importance of the body is the soul. In other words, what the Zohar is saying, not only the external is not the main thing, but rather there is something hidden in it. And even that something hidden has a, a deeper level also in it. So, so there's a body, there's a soul, and there's a soul of the soul. So, so the same thing Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says that the Torah has a body. Okay, so that's what is, uh, is, is easier uh, seen. The Inu Pikude Oraisa, the Ikrun Gufe Torah. So those are the commandments of the Torah that are given and all the laws which are called like that's the body of the Torah. So all of this, uh, the body of the Torah, the commandments, enclose themselves in clothing, which these are the stories, the narration, the narrative that is in the Torah. And as though it would give us the impression that the stories are what have caused these mitzvahs, these commandments to, to become. For example... You remember the story of Jacob, right? Jacob is traveling back from the father's, uh, the father-in-law's house, right? And there's a story in the Torah how he meets up with the archangel of, of Esau, his brother, and he has a, a wrestling match, right? He has a wrestling match, if you remember, and at that point, suddenly, the, it says the angel reached out and dislocated the, the, uh, by his hip, the, the leg, and, and he started limping, and then he overcame the angel. The angel let him go, and everything is fine. And then after that, it says, and therefore, uh, the, the vein, the, this, this, the sinus uh, vein, I think it's called in English, I'm not sure, of the leg of the animals should be forbidden to the Jewish people, right? It's called Git Hanoshe, that vein. So somebody that simply reads this section of the Torah thinks that, ah, oh, this is symbolic because Jacob had a fight with an angel and in the wrestling match, something happened to his leg, to his hip, and something was dislocated. So therefore, as a commemoration of that, we're not allowed to eat that part of the leg uh, in the hind leg of an animal after it's uh, slaughtered. So, so Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says this is foolishness to think that that's what came about. But rather, what, what the Zohar is explaining now, will continue to explain, is that not only there is a deeper meaning to all of this, but rather, all of this is explained to us just to give us an on-ramp as a ladder of understanding of the real deal, of what's behind it. In other words, what we have received as commandments here in the Torah are the effect. It's not the cause. The story is not the cause of the mitzvah. The story is just the effect in order for us to be able to understand some to have some relationship to the comprehension of the mitzvah, it is said it's just an on ramp, and basically it begs us to explore it further and deeper to be able to understand the real deal. Or, for example, when it comes to the laws of Benois Tzalafchad, the daughters of Tzalafchad, if you remember, uh, Tzalafchad was a fellow who, story by itself, how he ended up. Um, being uh, punished for something that he did wrong in the desert. And he had five daughters. And the daughters come to Moses and they say, well, we have no brothers. So what are we supposed to do? Why should the natural inheritance of our father be passed on to somebody else just because there's no sons in our family? So Moses says, hang in there. Let me have a talk with, uh, with God. And, uh, and God says, you know what? They're right. They, there should be a law, uh, and here's the law of inheritance, so that the, these daughters don't miss out in the inheritance. So somebody that simply reads the story may think that, ah, the laws of inheritance only came about as an afterthought 
because of a story of these five girls whose father had passed away and came forward, X, Y, Z was claimed that, so Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says that's absolutely not the case. The laws of inheritance are the will of God. And they have very high and deep root of where this law is coming from. In order to introduce and make us understand certain aspects of it and to give us the commandment, so therefore this story is brought down so we have a way of relating to it. And not only that, but to open up a door, open up our eyes, and give us an on-ramp to look deeper into all aspects of the mitzvah. So tipshin the alma lam is takli elo beahu levusha veihu sifud the oraisa. So the the foolish ones that are in the world, they don't look uh, any deeper. They just look at the outer garment of the Torah of how the Torah is presented, the simple the simple verses, the simple storyline. Velo yot e yasir, and they don't know anything else. They don't bother looking uh, at what's underneath that clothing, that outer clothing of those narration that is in the Torah. But those that do have a deeper understanding, and understanding meaning their eyes are open, they, they see more than that. They know that this is not just the superficial meaning of everything. So they don't look at just the, the, the story, but rather they look at the body which is underneath this outer clothing. And the, the wise people, we're talking about chachamim, sages, which are the servants of the supernal king, Inun the Kaimu Betura the Sinai, those that stood at the foot out of Mount Sinai, La Mistakli Ella Binishmasa the Ihi Ikara de Kolo Raisamamash. So they look not only not at the clothing, not only do they look at the body which is underneath the clothing of the Torah, but they look at the soul of the body of the clothing that is underneath the Torah. They understand that everything, even all the stories and all the commandments in the Torah, they all have an inner secret, an inner aspect. And, and that is, of course, we're talking about the, the aspects that are discussed in the teachings of uh, Hasidic teachings and Kabbalah and mysticism. Beth, you had a question? But we, didn't we all, weren't we all at the foot of Mount Sinai? Right? Yes. Yes, correct. So it wasn't so then that's all of us. That right? is correct. Very good observation. So th that is all of us. Of course, there oh. are some people that have now in a revealed way have pursued it, so to say their eyes have opened up and are learning and are pursuing uh the the depth of the Torah, but w when the Zohar says those sages that stood at the Mount of Sinai absolutely refers to the entire Jewish people because we were all there. So we all have the capability to open our eyes and delve deeper into everything in the Torah. Well, Zimna the Ose is a meaning is takla binishmosa the nishmosa the oraisa. And in the future, uh, the Zohar concludes this section by saying that in the future, when Mashiach comes, not only people would not be looking at the outer clothing of the Torah, not only people will be looking at the body of the Torah, which is underneath the surface, just what meets the surface, not only the Jewish people will be learning about the soul of the Torah, which is what we are doing. We're going, you know, we're learning Hasidus, we're learning Kabbalah to understand deeper aspects of the Torah. But in the times of Mashiach, we are going to be delving into the soul of the soul of the body of the clothing. In other words, in the times of Mashiach, there will be what will be considered almost like a new Torah. It's the same Torah, but on a completely different level, on a different depth, something that has never been revealed 
during these uh, 6,000 years. So uh, that will be a Torah of a different quality, of, of a different depth when Mashiach comes, which, by the way, is the very one of the benefits uh, and one of the reasons that uh, we learn Hasidus, Hasidic teachings, and mysticism in these later generations. Because later generations, I mean right before the coming of Mashiach. And that's why suddenly the gateways, the floodgates of Hasidic teachings got opened up a few hundred years ago to the public. Because before the coming of Mashiach, we need to start preparing for what's about to come. So it says that when Mashiach comes and there will be a whole new level of revelation, Hasidus that we learn today and the Kabbalah and mysticism that we learn today will be the aha of those times. What does it mean, the aha of those times? That means once Mashiach comes, we will be treated to this new level of, of revelation, of our eyes opening up, seeing godliness uh, in a way that has never been seen before, in a way right now our physical eyes are limiting us, but it will be an, an, with open spiritual eyes that we will be able to see godliness. And at that time, when we are going to be learning what is taught to us and we're going to be understanding godliness on a whole new level, we're going to say, aha, that was the concept that was being taught in the book of Zohar in the book of Tanya, in the Hasidic teachings, was making a reference to it. I see. So that was the tip of the iceberg. But at least it gave me an, an understanding, an on-ramp. So now, now I understand what was taught to me that day by Rabbi Danny when he was teaching me the Zohar. Even though Rabbi Danny himself didn't really fully understand it. But now I understand what we were trying to learn that day when we were learning the Zohar. So that will be the aha moment when Mashiach comes, when all these things are revealed and our reaction will be, aha, I get it now. It finally settles in. You know, it's pretty much like when your parents were giving you advice, right, as teenagers, and you laughed at it or you didn't understand it. You just, oh, okay, fine. This is a, it's a good saying. My father always says that. And then later on in life, when you yourself have become parents or grandparents, and you go, aha, now I understand what my parents were telling me. Now I get it. So that's exactly going to be uh, the same. So, um, so this, on this part of the Zohar is um, a few times the Lubavitcher Rebbe and the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe have spoken about in their writings and in their uh, Hasidic uh, teachings and gatherings. So first of all, uh, the Lubavitcher Rebbe pointed out on this portion of Zohar that we just learned how we see that all the, and this was in um, 1951 when the Lubavitcher Rebbe spoke about this, said we see from this section of the Zohar, the Torah portion of al how it, all the details of the stories of the Torah have a teaching and a guidance for all the generations to come. So it's not just something that applied then. So therefore, even in our time, we have to know that the Torah is an everlasting guidance to us. It's nothing that we say, oh, it was only relevant to 3,000 years ago and times have changed and so on and so forth. No, this is not a man-made Torah. This is a God-given Torah. So therefore, everything in it all the wisdom is everlasting for all the generations to come, no matter what happens and what changes. Furthermore, he wrote that in the Torah itself, there is an external and an internal. In Hebrew terminology, we call it chitzonius, external, upnimius, and internal. So the aspects of the Torah that are revealed, for example, you're talking about all the laws of the Torah, of what you're supposed to do, what you're not supposed to do in the code of Jewish law, and the Talmud, and the Mishnah. So these are all revealed aspects of the Torah. And, and the inner parts of the Torah are 
things that are normally hidden from the eyes. The previous Lubavitcher Rebbe explained in 1948 in, um, in one of his writings that it, a better way to explain and understand what it means, the revealed aspect of the Torah and, and the hidden aspect of the Torah. In other words, the revealed knowledge of Torah, that portion of Torah, is things that regular mind, the mind of a person can relate to. They are worldly things. For example, what you're allowed to eat, what you're not allowed to eat. Okay, these are physical objects. A person could uh, apply his seichel, his power of intellect, and understand it. Or if a cow gores another cow, or in, in modern day it would be if somebody drives, uh, has a car or has a worker that does something to somebody else. So all of these and, and everything that is taught in the Talmud is something that the logic and rationale of a person could wrap his or her mind around it. It's understood. Now, sometimes these are difficult subject matters, but nonetheless, it's things that a person can physically, with their physical understanding of the world, relate to. The hidden part of, parts of the Torah, the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe explains, are the knowledge of the Torah that your physical, the way you relate to the physical world is inadequate to understand those things. So when we're talking about, for example, the sefirot, the different worlds that have been created and how they function and kindness and the light of Hashem and so on and so forth, even the terminologies that we use, the allegories that we use, such as the light of Hashem, well, even that is something that, that we have a hard time understanding, right? Because it, there's, it's not a physical light that emanates from God. So things that our normal physically trained intellect cannot properly understand, those are all the hidden aspects of the Torah. And those, so how could we gain that knowledge. So there is the, the application of the mind and of the soul that has to happen. In other words, when a person applies himself or herself to intellectually to these things, slowly but surely, when a person gets trained to be able to divest his mind from just looking at everything in a physical structure, that's when suddenly the mind opens up and we're able to better understand the, the metaphysical, everything spiritual. And this, uh, and I will conclude with this um, item, is exactly what was the purpose of the Holy Baal Shem Tov, about 300 years ago, and the Alter Rebbe, uh, about 250 years ago, uh, in, in establishing the teachings of Hasidus and disseminating it to the entire Jewish population. And this is the key word here, the entire Jewish population. Because as you know, in the olden days, as, as it's very apparent from the text of the Zohars that we study, in the olden days, it was only the realm of very few. Select few would have the merit to delve into the esoteric parts of the Torah. However, once the Baal Shem Tov and then the Alter Rebbe came about, they changed all of this and they knew that this is needed for our generation before the coming of Mashiach. And the Lubavitch Rebbe stresses that being that they were Tzaddikim, righteous people of the highest caliber, being that they made the decision, as the famous saying goes, that when a righteous person makes a decree, God has to fulfill it. So they paved the way, the path for everyone else to be able to step by step move forward and climb up the ladder of understanding the, the hidden parts of the Torah. And there is a misunderstanding the Rebbe finishes that um, talk. There's a misunderstanding amongst some people, 
even by the way, the religious and even within the Orthodox community, there are some people that think that the esoteric part of the Torah, the, the hidden parts of the Torah, talking about Kabbalah, mysticism, Hasidus, could only be learned and should only be learned by somebody who is already well versed in all the other aspects of the Torah. Somebody that knows the entire five books of Moses by heart, knows all the books of prophets, knows the entire code of Jewish law, knows the entire Talmud and everything else. And only after that, they should delve into the hidden parts of the Torah and understanding the inner meanings of, of every word of the Torah. So while that is not the case, the Rebbe says, that it is for everybody, especially in our uh, generation, where we need the spice within the Torah, the spark within the Torah to actually be able to take our Judaism to the next step. And our generation needs it more than any other generation. Now, of course, let me state the fact that a person shouldn't think that by simply dabbling in the esoteric part of the Torah and getting their feet wet and having some basic not, uh, understanding, that means in a month from now, in a year from now, they're going to be flying in the air, you know, catching angels to, to, to play board games with or be able to perform miracles, okay? That would be a complete misunderstanding of what the learning of the secrets of the Torah is all about. But rather, yes, there is a level of spirituality. There is a level of holiness that could be attained by those that are very steeped in the knowledge of Torah, all aspects. And yes, they could reach a level where they could even uh, have an effect on how the natural order of the world functions. But that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is utilizing the aspects of Zohar, of Kabbalah, of Hasidus, which Hasidus by itself is already the, the cherry on top because what Hasidus does, it takes the teachings of Kabbalah and mysticism and it brings it down to a level that we could actually tap into it and use it. And it brings out, Hasidus brings out the beauty and the clear understanding of Kabbalah and mysticism. Otherwise, as you could tell from the text of many Kabbalah books, it could be very abstract, things that are taught in Kabbalah. But Hasidus is what brings it down and takes it not only from the level of understanding a, a topic, but it brings it down to a level where it would have an effect on you, on your mind, on your soul, on your emotions, and change the way you see the world, the way you yourself function, and the way you connect to godliness. And this, by the way, is one of the mistakes that some people make, and they fall into the trap of... I don't even want to mention their name. Some, some people, uh, Hollywood is famous for it and, uh, in, in Los Angeles, that they claim they're teaching Kabbalah mysticism and they attract all sorts of people, including celebrities and so on and so forth. It's all hype. They're taking something that has truth and using it and abusing it for side purposes. The entire purpose of Kabbalah mysticism is Hasidus. In other words, it's application in your daily life. And that's the true ladder of climbing in spirituality. There is no way to go deeper into Zohar and Kabbalah and grow every day and for your eyes to open up, your mind's eyes to open up more every day if not with the approach and the teachings of Hasidus, where it enables you to apply it to yourself. Otherwise, the next level in the ladder, the next door in the chambers of spirituality, of understanding higher, will not be opened up. 
your level of personal spirituality and your level of observance of, of Torah and mitzvahs is intertwined with how far you could climb up the ladder of Zohar and mysticism. So all those that present it as just some interesting knowledge, come and you will walk away as a Kabbalist. We're going to teach you X, Y, Z, and so on and so forth. And they get people excited. And people come back with all sorts of charts and, you know, oh, I, I scanned the Kabbalah today, I scanned the Zohar today. It's all nonsense. It starts with you. You learn whatever you learn, you absorb it, you meditate on it, and you allow it to take root, to take effect, to change you. And you literally have to ask yourself, so what, what I have learned today, how does it change me and my life and my spirituality? And when that's applied, now you have actually climbed up the ladder. And now you have access to the next rung in this ladder and to the next door to open up for you. And before you know it, you're able to connect all the dots. So you learn something here, you learn something there, and so on and so forth, and it all comes together. That level of purity of, of soul, the level of practicing mitzvahs is key because mitzvahs are what actually connects you. Zohar, Kabbalah, Hasidus is, is teaching, is, is making you understand how the connectivity works. But if you don't actually connect, it's all just theory, not practical. So that concludes the lesson for today. Let's make Torah practical. Let's learn it. Let's fulfill the mitzvahs. And God willing, we will fulfill the purpose of giving, uh, of us being given the innermost secrets of the Torah, Kabbalah and Hasidus, and that is to prepare us for the aha moment of the coming of Mashiach. Any questions that I could answer? Well, thank you, Rabbi. Pleasure. Pleasure. Yeah, this really rocked. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, David. Thank you, David yeah. Larry, yeah. Nadi, Beth, all of you. Michael. Thank Rick. you. Rick, as always, a pleasure. Hi. Okay, who do we have here? Everyone. Take care, Beth. Thank you for joining us today. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.